Something extraordinary happened in Abu Dhabi this week. Global leaders pledged to wipe out several diseases that have plagued humanity since the beginning of time. Bill Gates, the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, these were just a few of the dignitaries that signed on. And it was really an important moment. I mean, in this time of fake news, it was an affirmation of science. And in this period of growing nationalism, it was a commitment to global cooperation. But you know, honestly, as the leader of one of the largest global health nonprofits in the world, and also as one of the organizations that's going to be called on to make this happen, I kind of had a different reaction. Do you dudes know what you're even asking for? You mean, you know, it's kind of like getting that email from your boss asking you to do the impossible yesterday. So I had a drink. <laughs> I went to yoga. In that order, by the way. <laughs> and then I started thinking, you know, what's the real opportunity this presents? The lives saved and my own personal conviction to social innovation and activism. And I knew it was time to kind of roll up my sleeves and go to work. You and I are living in an extraordinary moment in human history. It's a time when new ways to fight old diseases are giving us the power to banish some of the worst killers from the earth. And you know what? Most people don't even know this is happening. So today I want to share with you the story of the global effort to eradicate diseases. A story of turning the impossible to the possible. Now, I'm not a doctor or a scientist, so I might not be the person you would normally expect to tell this story. I'm more actually what people call the practitioner, you know, the guy that's called in to get stuff done. I'm a liberal arts major. I've had many careers. My mom still worries about that. <laughs> and in my current role, I'm a business guy who's frequently at the leadership tables in global health. And in that role, I've had to have a few technical terms explained to me. So let me start there. So control. What do we mean by controlling a disease? That's when we work to reduce the incidence of a disease, usually through like a prevention or a treatment program. And our goal there is to minimize death and suffering. Then there's elimination. Now, elimination is when we do that so well that that disease no longer exists in a, in a, in a specific part of the world. Malaria is actually a good example. Did you know that malaria used to be a major public health problem here in the United States? Then we committed to eliminate it. In fact, we put the CDC in Atlanta, right in the heart of the epidemic. <laughs> and in 1951, we eliminated it. However, many countries in Asia and Africa today are still just controlling malaria. In fact, about 400,000 people die every year of malaria. And most are kids under five. Then there's eradication. That's when not a single person on earth is afflicted by this disease. We've only eradicated one human disease in history. One. Smallpox. In uh, the first half of the 20th century, about a 500 million people died of smallpox. But we eradicated it and declared it eradicated in 1980. It's actually one of the most amazing achievements in human history. But what's interesting is smallpox no longer has to stand alone as sort of a one-hit wonder because there are several projects underway to eradicate other diseases, and it's actually become a global movement. Now, remember, I'm the practitioner at the table, so I usually bring a pretty skeptical eye to this, these things, like a movement. And so I ask the tough business questions, like, okay, 
Can we do this? How are we going to execute it? Should we do it? Can we? Well, it's a qualified yes. Let me step back. How many diseases do you think there are in the world? 50, 100, a few hundred? The answer is none of those. It's actually thousands. It's a little creepy to think about. But most of those will never be eradicated. Given what we know today, diseases like HIV and tuberculosis or even Ebola, these were doing better at controlling, but eradication is unlikely. However, there is a handful of diseases that with the right emerging scientific tools and the right targeted resources, we can uh, eliminate and then eradicate in our lifetime. The global community, health communities, kind of converged on this list of targets. So, polio. 30 years ago, about 350,000 new cases of polio re were reported each year. This year, we've only, we've only seen 12. 12 cases. And next year, we think we'll see the final case of polio virus in the world. And then there's guinea worm. You know, I never actually heard of guinea worm before I took this job. I don't know, have you all? It's pretty horrible. You get it from contaminated water, and then this long worm forms, and it emerges, sometimes like through a blister on your skin or even through your eye. And it causes immense suffering, pain, and often lifelong disabilities. 30 years ago, there were about three and a half million people in the world had guinea worm. Last year, we've only had 25 reported cases. Thanks to water filters, by the way. <laughs> so, yes, we can eradicate diseases. So now you get to that other, the next question, like, okay, but how do we do this? Well, of course, there's no easy answer, and every disease is pretty different, but there are some common challenges, and the, we, the global community we, have actually started creating some pretty interesting solutions. Well, the first thing you need to do is create the right scientific uh, product, uh, the safe, effective, and affordable. Things like vaccines and drugs and diagnostics and tools. But the problem is, is most companies actually don't invest in these products because they're primarily afflicting the poorest people in the world. So we're trying to come up with new approaches. For instance, government incentives to get industry engaged, philanthropic support for research and development, Nonprofits like PATH, who are actually developing products ourselves, and a number of interesting scientific collaborations with government. In fact, this has been so successful that we're seeing enormous scientific achievement, and we have hundreds of products in our pipeline. But just having the right product isn't enough. You got to get it to the people that need it. And this presents huge logistical challenges. So, for instance, a vaccine must stay cold. So we have to think about ways to uh, keep vaccines refrigerated in places there's no electricity. And we're working on new formulations for vaccines where you don't even need refrigeration. And then there's the uh, transportation issues, like we're working on new ways to reach remote communities, including drones and actually better ways to track and manage the supply chain with electronic vouchers and barcodes and other things. It's so like a little bit Amazon meets global health. <laughs> but then you have to think about the workforce. So you may be surprised to know that in many places we work, um, many of the community health workers are, are volunteers, and there, there are never enough of them. So governments must mobilize and train huge armies of people to undertake this effort. 
1974, there were about 200,000 cases of smallpox still in India. The government put a, a, a workforce of tens of thousands of people against this problem. Actually, they visited every other month about 90% of every household in India. The next year, due to this amazing workforce, and not a single case, none. But you know, you can get the logistics, and you can find the products, and you can even get the workforce in place, but communities need to participate. And actually, sometimes they don't. In the early 2000s in Nigeria, religious leaders, some religious leaders issued fatwas um, against some uh, vaccines with, based on the false claim that they might reduce fertility. In, in other countries, we've seen vaccine workers deliberately targeted and murdered. Now, fortunately, we're getting a lot better at working with tribal and religious leaders to engage communities and create demand. In fact, in some instances, they've been our best allies. Okay, so we've been doing this for a long time, figuring out how to get all these parts working together. So what's creating this movement now? Two things. The first, the amount of political and financial investments has risen exponentially. There have been, you know, Abu Dhabi is just the most recent example. There have actually been a number of big commitments of money. And global leaders around the world are making more political commitments. And we're starting all sorts of organizations. In fact, there's one expressly called the End Fund. The second accelerator is the power of digital transformation. Think about it. Mobile phones, analytics, satellite mapping software, even AI. It's actually amazing on the ground to see how much is beginning to happen in Africa. Let me give you an example in Zambia. In certain regions in southern Zambia 10 years ago, one out of every two people had malaria. Now, just think if that was this audience. That would mean every other one of you, it would be either you or your neighbor had malaria. Now, it's about one out of 200, and it's getting better. The main reason is that we are beginning to see health workers use mobile phones to track and manage every single case of malaria real time. And then they map the affected areas. And then everybody in that area gets uh, a, a, an anti-malarial drug. And that area is about like 100 meters. It's the average, the flight range of your average mosquito. It's maybe something you want to remember the next camping trip. <laughs> so anyway, we actually start to give every, everyone an anti-malarial because it's not only that the people who have malaria symptoms have the parasites, but people who, uh, many people don't have those symptoms. So we're going not only after treating sick patients, but we're actually trying to eliminate the parasites. And then we're actually using very cool topographical information to map on water and rainfall patterns so we can isolate just where mosquitoes are breeding. The power of this data has driven an 85% reduction in malaria deaths in Zambia in just three years. In fact, in fact, Zambia's government has declared a commitment to, have, to fully eliminate malaria by 2021. Okay. So, we can do this, and actually, we're getting better and better on how. But then I have to ask this final and sometimes surprisingly difficult last question. Should we? Is disease eradication worth it? Okay. The estimation of what we've spent on the polio eradication so far is about $15 billion. And because these last cases are so hard to, do, to get to, that we think that the last 
case will cost about $200 million to stamp out. $200 million. And in these same places, many kids aren't getting any measles vaccines, for instance. And measles still kill 100,000 people or more every year. And a measles vaccine only costs 25 cents a dose. 200 million, 25 cents. So a lot of global health leaders, or some, are really concerned about this trade-off and actually question the opportunity cost. You know, should we be spending, should be going after more urgent health needs, or should we be spending a couple hundred million dollars to go after the last case of polio? Is eradication necessary? It's actually a quite difficult um, moral and political and business question. And actually, they're very legitimate arguments on both sides. In the end, I believe we should pursue disease eradication. In fact, I think we must. Well, why? Well, first, the human and financial impacts are compelling. In the polio eradication effort, we've already saved 13 million kids from paralysis. And we believe that once we're done, we'll save the world billions of dollars. But then there's the equity argument. I am not okay with a world where wealthy countries get to eliminate diseases and poorer countries have to just keep working at controlling them. How, how can I accept that what is absolutely essential for my child's health, for our children's, isn't necessary for others? But then, Think about the historic um, potential that this movement unlocks. If we eradicate one disease, we'll get better at and know more about eradicating the next and the next and the next. Moreover, this becomes a virtuous cycle. Better health leads to smaller families, stronger communities, more productivity, and, and more prosperity. And so it, it reinforces itself. Moreover, if we eradicate diseases and if we prove we can deliver on these audacious goals, we'll build more credibility to go and get the financial and the political support we need to go tackle the world's next big challenges, to go bend the amazing arc of human progress even further. That's the world I want my kids to live in. That's why we should continue to champion the global effort to eliminate and eradicate diseases. It can be done. Thank you.